Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship. We begin by acknowledging the traditional land we stand upon is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and neutral peoples, as well as the Chippewa of Nawash, the Odawa, and the Saugeen Ojibwe people. We recognize and value the First Peoples' continued stewardship of the land and water. And we acknowledge that the treaties of the past still impact our work toward truth and reconciliation. This territory was subject to treaties under which multiple nations agreed to care for the land and resources by the Great Lakes in peace. We also acknowledge and recognize the Upper Canada Treaties signed with regard in this land, which include Treaty Number 25, 29 and Treaty Number 45 and a half. Our role as treaty people commit us to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation, gratitude, and with respect to our Indigenous neighbors. It is good to be together uh, once more, although not in person, uh, together online. The service today is uh, recognizing that today is the Indigenous Day of Prayer ahead of the National Indigenous Day. And I am very grateful that we have participating in our service by pre-recording, pre-recorded video um, the leadership at the Toronto Urban Native Center. Participating is Sandra Campbell, who is an MDiv student at Wycliffe College and who comes from the Mahata Mohawk First Nation. And the Reverend Karen, the Reverend Leah Kern, an MDiv uh, and Anglican priest. And the Reverend, the Reverend Evan Swant Smith, who is a United Church Minister, Turtle Clan, and Anishinaabe. If you're not aware, the Toronto Urban Native Centre is a joint ministry of the United Church and the Anglican Church. And I am, on your behalf as well, very grateful that they have so generously shared uh, their material for the service today. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to include it all, uh, because uh, they sent lots. Um, anyway, so uh, again, we are grateful. And I remain grateful to our uh, AV whizzes, uh, Shelley and Hudson War and Nancy Ross, who um, go with the flow, because it seems every week there's a little something that is different and throws us off and we have to figure it out. I also want to say thank you to Linda Street, who again is le lending her voice to our service this week. We are deeply grateful, Linda. Thank you. And to Doug Robinson, our organist. So as part of our opening this morning, I invite you to uh, uh, not just watch, but to engage with uh, the opening smudge offered by the Toronto Urban Native Centre. With honesty, as we prepare ourselves to meet our Creator, may your hands be cleansed that they can create beautiful things with love. With great respect, may your eyes be cleansed that you might see the signs and great wonders of the Creator's world. May your eyes be cleansed that you bravely hear and see the truth. May your throat be cleansed that you might speak rightly with loving kindness when words are needed. May your feet be cleansed that you might take you where you are most needed to be through your journey on the pathway of life. May your heart be cleansed that you might hear its message clearly with humility. 
May the people, while learning together, become mindful and receive the wisdom while they are in the sacred space, be washed and cleaned by the fragrant smoke of this stage. May that same smoke, while spiraling to the heavens, carry our petitions of truth to our Creator. Now that we are of one mind and unified as the people, The Creator has gathered us for this time of worship. The Creator has gathered us to pause from our daily routines to praise and to pray, to make confession and receive forgiveness. The Creator has gathered us in spirit, if not in person, and so we lift our hearts and offer ourselves to the one who has called us here. Let us worship the Lord. Our first hymn today is uh, Praise with Joy, the World's Creator, number 312 in uh, Voices United. come together before God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, you show us that there is room for all and offer a welcome that is deep and wide and rich. You invite us to join together bonded by your love that is deep and wide and rich. We offer our praise for life, for love of friends and family, for the community of our church. You feed us, O Christ, with teachings of kindness, respect, and justice. Forgive us when we forget these teachings or are stingy with our kindness. 
Forgive us the moments when entitlement replaces respect. And forgive us when working or doing justice is too hard or demands more than we want to give. Holy One, you have gathered us in to worship and pray. May your spirit touch each who hear these words and may hope grow. Holy One, you have gathered us in to worship and pray. Hear our silent prayers of confession. In Jesus' name we pray, who taught us to pray together singing. we can be certain in the name of Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven thanks be to God amen
Thank you very much, Linda. So the next part of the service is our message from the Toronto Urban uh, Native Centre. And the first speaker is Sandra Campbell, who, as I mentioned, is from Mahata Mohawk First Nation. And then the Reverend Lee Kern, and then the Reverend Evan Swant-Smith. And between them, I will invite you to join with Linda in singing um, uh, the Kyrie as uh, our response to what we are hearing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, and that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Paraphrasing the scripture to testify. In the beginning, the word was spirit, flowing from God and through God. That was God. The peacemaker Jesus was spirit, starting with God, while all things came into being through God. What came from spirit a gift of life starting from the spiritual realm through the living crystal clear waters. It then became the spiritual being into flesh with life, the light of all peoples, the light that everlasting shines. Then John testifies about the light so all might come to believe. Presently, how it relates, I have witnessed and can testify to the pain and the strength with light within the Toronto Indigenous community members and my family of Indian residential school survivors and Indian day school survivors. The dedication from all within the communities across the nation through the preliminary stages of the process with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners, the national events and closing I've had the opportunity through Toronto Urban Native Ministry to chaperone many groups of Indian residential school survivors to most of the TRC national events. For the survivors to either witness history in the making or provide a safe space where they were able to submit their testimonies. Through carving safe and sacred places, I had held hands silently supporting providing emotional supports through the process. It was hard. It was difficult. It was painful. But I stepped in, and I was there because it had to be done. Presently, I am honored to help and still continue with this work of love. The opportunity to witness the healing moments, to witness the resilient strength and the light that once was a little flicker, I whisper, growing into a brilliant beam of light. The gospel calls for Christians to remember that gift of life and that life of all peoples across the world to lovingly honor and respect while testifying to that light. The church repentance process and the theological reasons of their institution must clearly conf confront their corrupt trespasses and their part in deep involvement. 
how can anyone imagine that the church apology itself is living in action and reconciliation? Why does the church expect the onus to be on the indigenous? The church played an important role alongside the government. Then hearing the hollowness through justifying of any mean, meaningful action. How can a society continue to promote and demonstrate a commitment and amends while the innocent are still experiencing severe oppression and racism of the colonial institution structures that continue promoting and controlling the narrative by deflecting the responsibility back onto the indigenous? Why does the indigenous woman live in fear when they step out of their homes, expressing their uncertainty of safety, that they may be attacked or killed? Why do the women and the youth have to tell their loved ones that if they, they would never abandon their family and come look for them, they put it in handwritten notes and post it online to come look for me if they go missing. Nowadays, it's not even safe in their own homes, the fear of being arrested or killed by authorities when they're not lawbreakers or hear racial slurs on their deathbed while receiving health care. The damage has been done and it continues to this day. Not until meaningful action to show a commitment to make amendments and, the, and pointing out the toxicity structures, still promoting that stereotyping and racism. How can true justice right relations continue? An apology is just the beginning. An important first step towards true repentance and reconciliation. The leaning in and rebuilding a just society for all. Until then, the apology is just words. There need to be action and positive involvement before testifying to the light. Not until unified true repentance has occurred before the work of right relations can begin. It's hard. It's difficult. It's painful. But you have to be here. It needs to be done. It's the right thing by coming to terms with the deep roots of the church and institutional sins. Christians of all denominations need to truly work in reconciliation in that apology. All indigenous related church archives need to be released for families to have closure. Today, have respect for the grieving nationwide of the 215 children found in that mass grave at Camp Loops Indian Residential School. It has to be done into working towards reconciliation and justice right relations. What are you going to do? John came to testify to that light. John testified so all can believe the light of love, compassion and acceptance and, and justice. Come back to the living light of Jesus and the everlasting love of God. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. 
But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. Our scripture this morning is full of striking contrasts, light versus darkness, the world's coming into being yet not knowing God, coming home and being rejected, the power of knowledge and the power of willful denial, the love of belonging and the sting of rejection. Many who survived Indian residential school knew too well this feeling of not being accepted the feeling of coming home to those who don't know you. Children stolen, their names removed and instead given a number, severely abused for speaking their language. Survivors after a decade of forced separation, many unable to locate their home. Many unable when finding home to speak the same language as their parents or grandparents home, belonging, family, stolen from hundreds of thousands. Many who ran away from residential school or abusive foster care ended up on the streets. Too many robbed of the feeling of having a safe place, a home where you are accepted, seen as a sacred child of the creator. Our gospel calls us to remember that as Christians, we worship one who was rejected, one who had no home, one who was rejected and cast out, the one no truth is hidden from. Jesus's total identification with those who have been rejected is at the heart of the good news of the gospel. His zealous love spoke in contrast pushing people to choose a side, that of the oppressor or that of the oppressed. Throughout scriptures, Jesus, is cri Jesus cries out, if only they had eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus spoke frankly about the power of willful denial and ignorance. The light shines, but some would rather not face it. Our church and country have been experiencing a reckoning. Power, wealth, and policies have been built on the theft of homes. The families of some have prospered over the murder and genocide of others' families. The light has shone forth. The truth has been spoken, but some are not listening. Denial of the ongoing genocide against Indigenous nations runs deep. For some, it is only now with the uncovering of unmarked mass graves of children that the reality of residential schools is setting in. Yet Indian residential school survivors have been in our communities. Many sleep outside our very church steps yet they may only be seen as a person to receive charity, not as members of the community whose leadership matters, whose opinions matter. As a church in society, we have rejected these survivors of genocide. Many survivors and intergenerational survivors have never been compensated, never received housing, have been on supportive housing wait lists in Toronto for decades. This spring, I buried a wonderful man, his youngest child just in high school. An intergenerational Indian residential school survivor, he was very proud of being a survivor. One freezing night, he accessed an emergency respite, a shelter. He hadn't been feeling well and he was worried about his health. He experienced racism that night in the shelter and he called it out from the shelter staff and he was banned from the shelter for disruptive behavior. He wasn't feeling well and he needed help. Instead, he was thrown out. He received suspicion and racist comments. He died of a heart attack just outside the shelter. His family continues to grieve. 
The genocide against the people of the land is ongoing. It continues. Our systemic denial of the genocidal practices and policies of this land continue to cause harm. We have been crying out for reparations and housing and treaty rights and clean water and investigation into the thousands of undocumented deaths of those who died at Indian residential school for decades. Survivors and their families have the burden of carrying their traumatic experiences, educating the public about it, and charting a course for right relations. Yet the healing light of their truths continue to be rejected. Indigenous peoples are tired of having horrific trauma on display in order to be listened to, respected, and honored. Too often we have closed the door to the light of their truth. The light has shone. Will you help lift the veil of denial? Will you testify to the light of truth? Will you let that light, that truth of God, reshape your life? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This has been an incredibly difficult couple of weeks to be in ministry. There have been so many times where I've had to explain to people the tensions of being in Indigenous ministry and in Indigenous community. How do we make sense of the violence that the rest of Canada has learned about at the Kamloops Residential School and now several other schools, and yet still support the church? It's these tensions that as Indigenous ministers we hold constantly. Yet, I said at the beginning that I think sometimes we forget that for many Indigenous people, the churches are a place of healing and of home, and that our Indigenous elders have fought for many years to have their place in the church. I remember when I first heard about the apology that was issued to residential school survivors from the United Church of Canada in 1988. And I remember hearing this story and how the elders acknowledged that they heard the apology, but they didn't accept it. Because to accept it, they needed to see change. And yet here we are so many years after the apology, and often I feel like so much has yet to change. We are still hearing the stories of the atrocities that happen at residential school. We are still seeing the injustice of our children not receiving as much funding for their education, of our communities that don't have access to basic infrastructure like housing and clean water. 
And we've seen the way that COVID has affected our communities in ways that we couldn't have even imagined. When the pandemic first hit, it didn't take more than a few days for us to realize that most organizations in Toronto had closed down. And so people started to show up on the doorsteps of Church of the Holy Trinity, where we have our offices, hungry and desperate. They couldn't even access a place to wash their hands or go to the washroom because of course everything was in lockdown. And so we started serving meals, sometimes up to 300 a day. And as the encampment grew around the church, we started to offer more and more support services, eventually offering the first mobile COVID testing site and also the first COVID barrier-free vaccination site one year later. We were driven to do these things because as Christians, as community members, we saw what was happening in our communities and knowing that we serve a God of justice, we couldn't be quiet. We had to leap into action. Last weekend, I met a young girl named Faye. She was so moved by hearing about the mass grave in Kamloops that she created stickers which featured an orange handprint and said, every child matters. And she's telling them to raise money for a community that has no access to clean water. My partner and I went and purchased some, and to say thank you for her work, I gave her a necklace with my clan, a turtle, on it. She pet the turtle lovingly and said it was so cute and she was going to take care of it forever. This was the same week that the mom of one of my girl guides sent me a picture of the guide and her brother placing orange rocks that they had painted in front of their Catholic elementary school while wearing orange t-shirts. I think sometimes when tragedy strikes, when we hear about these disparities, we don't know what to do. But in the scripture, we hear Jesus say that to enter the kingdom of God, we have to become like children. Well, my friends, these are the children we have to become like. The ones who have heard the stories and who have leapt to action. I truly believe that God does not make us suffer, but God is there with us in the suffering and that redemption happens when God takes the suffering we have experienced and somehow still manages to use it for good. Right now as a church, we're at a crossroads where we have heard more and more horrific stories about what indigenous people have and continue to suffer at the hands of the state. And we're at a crossroads where we can make a decision on whether or not we will live into the apologies that have been issued or continue to just offer lip service. God calls us to be the love in the world. And yet we have a long legacy as a country where racism was able to thrive because people believed that other people were not worthy of the same love and respect. A hierarchy has been created of who is deserving and who is not. Yet in our reading from today, John clearly states that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Every single person that enters into creation was made through God, and it's through this intimate relationship with God that we are given life. And that life is the light of humankind. And so now is the time where we, as a whole community of Christ, need to shine our light into the darkness. We need to show that just like in the resurrection, Christ's death does not have the final word. The death of children at the hands of the church and the state 
does not have to be the final word. We are people of the light and we have to lead the way showing how to live into that. My friends, God has assured us that we are giving grace upon grace and that we are a forgiven people. So go into the world, become like children, make sure that you listen to the stories, make sure that your hearts are open to the pain that indigenous people have experienced, but also look for the good, look for the places where our communities are thriving, where our women are picking up their teachings and protecting the water and the land where our men are picking up their teachings and are protecting the fires and the communities. We are a resilient people. We are a people of God. And we will overcome any of the darkness that this world puts before us. And we need your help to do that. Amen. Amen. Again, my thanks to um, the leadership at the Toronto Urban Native Ministries for sharing their words and their insights and some of their story. And I know that um, the message can be hard and, uh, and heavy, but we walk forward with open ears and trust that God walks with us. We continue, as I have mentioned each week, to be grateful for your offerings, whether they are offerings of time, of energy, or of treasure. All are valued. Let us pray. Though we are not physically together, we know that the work and ministry of your church continues, O Christ. And we offer ourselves with our gifts that the world beyond our church family may know the depth and breadth of your amazing love. May these gifts be used to share your love generously and justly. In Jesus' name, amen. And we have a mission and service video uh, highlighting some of the work of the Healing Fund. Bojo, bojo, webdoon manda. I used to teach uh, junior kindergarten and I was in uh, Anishinaabem when grade uh, JK immersion at the time and there wasn't a lot of resources but I turned on uh, YouTube and there were superhero videos so I thought why not make these videos and we'll just have all the superheroes speak in uh, Anishinaabem when. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action include revitalizing Indigenous languages. When people can speak their ancestral language, they have better self-esteem, are healthier, and their relationships are stronger. That's why, thanks to your support through Mission and Service, Espigan is teaching the Anishinaabemowin language to young people through creating superhero films. Both my parents are Anishinaabe. Um, my mother is actually a residential school survivor. We weren't allowed to speak our own languages. We weren't allowed to be who we were. We weren't allowed to practice our own ceremonies. She grew up thinking that the language wasn't that important. She's learning now, as she's slowly learning now her own language, and she, she likes to do a morning prayer in the language every morning. We just want to show that we're still here, our voice matters, our language is very much still alive to this day. Every single person is a superhero. Every single person has a gift to share with the world. And I think that's one of the, the most important things is realizing what, what's the gift that you can bring to your community. All right, and action.
Extra miigwech to everyone who donated to the Healing Fund and Mission and Service uh, for making this project uh, possible. Let us come together before God in prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, when listening is difficult, grant us courage. When sitting with new truth is uncomfortable, grant us strength. When confession is a stumbling block, grant us insight. We are grateful, O oh God, for the voices of those who share their story. We are grateful, O oh God, for the space to listen to our indigenous brothers and sisters. Bless the work of Indigenous leaders across Canada who lead and heal in their communities and who also offer their gifts beyond their own community so that we all might work toward reconciliation and justice. O oh God of mercy and grace, we are grateful for all the ways that you have encountered us during these days. For vaccines, we rejoice. And opportunities to see family and friends, we lift our voices in a joyful hallelujah. For the opportunity to return to places of recreation and recreation, we lift our voices in a hallelujah. God of mercy and grace, walk with all those who suffer. We pray for the sick, for the dying, and for the grieving. We pray, O oh Christ, for the hungry, for the homeless, for ones fleeing violence. May they know your peace and presence, O oh Christ, and may we offer ourselves to do what we can to bring comfort, kindness, justice, and hope. And now because we trust in your love and your presence, O oh God, we lift up the names of all those for whom we are concerned. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is number 606, In Christ There Is No East or West.
And now this day, may you be grateful for voices that share their story, even if they are uncomfortable. And we know and acknowledge that the journey to reconciliation is long. So may Christ, the reconciler, lead us on the way. May Christ, who brings together what has been torn apart, lead us on the way. May Christ, whose love, grant us hope for the journey and the work, lead us on the way. Go now in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sustainer, this day and forever. Amen.